Okay. Hello and welcome, everyone. How's everyone doing this evening? My name is Shane Hanafi. I'm the Redbud Chapter President. We have a fantastic talk for you today on our local native pitcher plant, Darlingtonia. But first, I want to tell you a bit about our chapter and what it is we do. So the Redbud Chapter is one of 35 local chapters of the California Native Plant Society. Our region is the western halves of Placer and Nevada counties. And so we offer educational workshops and programs, much like the one you're about to see. Uh, we offer field trips to go and see the plants. We do advocacy and conservation work to protect our environment. And we hold native plant sales, <clears throat> excuse me, in the fall and the spring. Uh, if you're not a member of CMPS yet, we highly encourage you to join. Your membership fees can be sent yearly, or you can sign up to become a perennial member, which is essentially like the Netflix model. You pay a recurring payment monthly, and it just makes sure that your membership never lapses. Um, your membership nets you subscriptions to our two magazines, to our chapter newsletter, you get access to members only events and trips, and you get early access to our plant sales. And believe me, you're gonna want early access to our plant sales, judging by how fast our plants fly off the shelves. Uh, to sign up, head over to cmps.org and click the join button at the top of the page and make sure to select Redbud as your chapter of choice when prompted to do so. Um, we've got some upcoming events I would like to tell you about. On February 5th, in just about a week or so, um, we're gonna be hosting a winter snowshoeing trip up in the Sierras. Um, on February 13th, you can join myself as I lead a hike concentrated on mosses and possibly ferns, and maybe there might, we might even see some flowers out there. They seem to be popping early this year. The last week of February, a uh, date to be determined, we are going to be hosting Al Ludke, who is going to be talking about the uh, biology of the fascinating fairy moths. And February 27th, we're gonna have our first spring wildflower field trip. I know everyone's uh, really excited for all the wildflowers this year. And uh, keep an eye out for our spring sale, which should happen probably sometime uh, late April or early May. But again, date to be determined. You can follow our website and social media for updates on those things. You can find us on Facebook. We have a Facebook group where you can post uh, identification questions, uh, questions about native plant gardening, or just nerd out with other plant nerds. We're also on Instagram and YouTube where you can find this video posted after the fact in case you want to watch it again. Okay, without further ado, let's get on with the presentation. We welcome Jameson Chilton. He's a board member of the North American Saracenia Conservancy, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to preserving the natural habitat and genetic diversity of the native pitcher plant genus Saracenia, which is found primarily on the east side of the Rockies. Uh, our Western member of the Saracenia family is Darlingtonia Californica, and they share the common feature of trapping prey in a liquid filled tube made of modified leaves. Jameson has spent the past seven years monitoring and researching this plant and its habitats, and he's graciously agreed to come and talk to us all about Darlingtonia, its ecological relationships, and the conservation issues that surround it. So how this is going to work is essentially we're going to uh, have everyone keep their videos off and be muted the entire time. This just saves on bandwidth and uh, keeps um, distractions at a minimum. Uh, but we do invite questions. And so I'd ask you if you have any questions, please write them in the chat box in the lower right there. I will be uh, monitoring that chat for your questions and we will ask Jameson them at the very end. And so with that, Jameson, do you want to take it away? I will. Thank you. And um, yeah, thank you, Shane. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, I will let everyone know that I'm going to be doing my little slideshow on my laptop and uh, speaking from my cell phone. Um, so I will have my video off until the end. That way it's not bouncing between a video of me and the slideshow I'm trying to show, um, just so things are less confusing. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and we can get on with it. Okay, perfect. So I'm here to talk today about Darlingtoni Ecology and conservation. Um, and just talking to Shane a little bit before the meeting started, uh, I realized that not everyone may be familiar uh, with Darlingtonia and its uh, sister genus Saracenia. Um, so before I got into you know any kind of uh, ecology and conservation, I just wanted to kind of do a quick rundown of uh, the plant's morphology, um, just so we would uh, we would know 
you know, what's kind of going on and what's what and what everything looks like. Uh, so here on the screen in front of you is a, a mature Darlingtonia Californica specimen. Um, this is a plant growing out in Butterfly Valley in Plumas County. And uh, if none of you have been to Butterfly uh, Valley, it's very nice. Um, I used to go, I used to live in Quincy, so I used to go kind of frequently. It is out just outside of Quincy, past the Mount Huff Ranger District. Um, they have instructions on how to get there. It's a nice uh, botanical area, and it's fairly local to your chapter. Um, and they've they've bulldozed the road now to like let the uh, fin reclaim that area, and they've got a nice walking trail all the way around. So you don't have to walk through the fin and trample any of the plants there. Um, but you can see Darlington and Californica. You can see Drosa rotundifolia. And you may or may not be able to find some matricularia species at the pond at the bottom of the fin. And so here is a good photo of some plants growing out in the Smith River drainage. And you can see all up and down the pictures of the plants. And Darlingtonia, as it grows, it is actually unique among the uh, Saracenia ki family of plants and that the pictures twist as they grow up. And the thinking behind this is that as they twist, uh, they face outwards away from the growth point of the plant so that all of the pictures are not facing each other. All of these kind of mustache appendages as they are formally known um, are facing away from each other and the likelihood of attracting and trapping you know bugs and other insects is greater. And then once an insect crawls up here there's a little lip and I will show you a, a photo of a Saracenia and you can see the analogous uh, construct on a Saracenia picture. Um, but the lip is internal and then there's this bulbous hooded dome with these clear uh, sections of the plant. I've heard it said that Darlingtonia is the only plant to have perfectly clear membranes. I don't know if that's true. I've never seen any evidence to the contrary, um, but I've never talked to someone who is extremely knowledgeable about it. So if you are out there and extremely knowledgeable about you know, opaque and clear plant tissue, please leave a comment. I'd be curious to know, you know, if it if it's true, if they're the only plant or if there are others. And then we'll go here to Saracenia and you can see this is kind of the lip I was talking about. It's a rolled over top of the leaf um, and it's slippery right here, harder for insects to get a grip and they wind up falling down. This is the lid of a Saracenia pitcher. And its function is similar to the kind of fishtail appendage on a Darlingtonia pitcher. And it's thought that the two structures are, you know, basically the same, that the fishtail appendage of a Darlingtonia and the lid of a Saracenia, you know, ancestrally were, you know, the same thing. And that actually the, uh, the hood of a Darlingtonia, the dome of a Darlingtonia is really just a bloated and kind of contorted um, pitch your throat, which would be this area here. And then um, I think that that should hopefully kind of, you know, give us just kind of a, a good quick understanding of Darlingtonia and Saracenia morphology. Um, if you guys have any additional questions, just let me know. I'd be happy to go over it, you know, to the best of my ability. Uh, and with that, I'd like to start into the rest of my talk about, you know, ecology and conservation. Uh, so Darlingtonia grows, you know, their habitat. Uh, they have three main habitats, uh, fins, seeps, and riparian areas. Uh, to the best of my understanding, fins and seeps are differentiated in that fins are areas with uh, peat accumulation and seeps are not necessarily areas with peat accumulation. Uh, so here is an example of a fin. Um, that's me out there uh, doing a little collection of some seed. Um, but this is a, a fin and there is pretty thick peat in this area, probably several feet thick. Um, and this is all on a very gradual incline and there is water slowly percolating through all the substrate. A seep isn't uh, necessarily a fin in that it doesn't have peat, but you will find Darlingtonia growing in seeps like serpentine seeps or you know any other substrate that's not peaty. Uh, it could be, you know, rough gravel, or it could be, you know, almost sandy, or, you know, any other kind of soil. Uh, on the Smith River drainage, there are a lot of areas where Darlingtonia grow 
in pretty coarse and rough serpentine gravel or on the sides of serpentine boulders or you know cliff faces uh, with very little substrate you know maybe the decaying leaves of past seasons or you know some associated moss could be sphagnum moss could be other species um, I'm not very good at identifying bryophytes, unfortunately. I can tell when something is sphagnum and when it is not, and that is about the extent of my ability. And even then, it's kind of sketchy. Um, but you can see them in those areas, or you can see them in riparian areas. There are a few areas I've been to um, out around Mount Shasta, where Darlingtonia will grow not on river sides or lake sides, but on you know smaller stream sides. Um, a lot of rivers and even creeks in those areas once the snow starts to melt in the spring, you know, the water flow is very heavy. There's, you know, flooding and, you know, any plants that would grow on the side of that river uh, would be pretty easily washed away. So usually the creek sides you find them on are very, you know, relatively small creek sides. And then, you know, when we think of Saracenia, we think of them growing in bogs, usually um, in the American South and the American East. Darlingtonia is said not to grow in bogs. And a bog is an area, you know, with, depending on who you ask, uh, it's, a, it's an area with basically no, you know, water movement and that is fed by rainwater. Um, all Darlingtonia habitat that I've been to has been fed by spring water, you know, from an aquifer that's recharged with rain and or snow in the winter. Um, but I have found one area out by Trinity Lake that is unique in that um, there's next to no water movement. Uh, the peat there is very thick. Uh, water level is either at or above the growth point of the plants, uh, usually just at the growth point of the plants. And uh, it's the only place that I have found Darling Tony growing side by side with uh, Aquisitum, which is horsetail. And I think that that is pretty neat. Uh, I wish I had a good photo of it, uh, but the days I, I was out there, the weather wasn't very nice. Um, and horsetail, is a plant that is usually, in my experience, associated with, you know, kind of stagnant or not very fast flowing, you know, areas. Uh, so it was very cool to see that. And then the water temperature throughout those areas, even in that kind of stagnant area, um, water temperature is cool, you know, in these fins and seeps, they're fed by aquifers and springs and rivers uh, throughout Northern California and Western Oregon. Um, and it's always cool. The roots are almost always cool. Uh, I've done a little bit of water temperature measuring. It's almost always, you know, about 50 degrees. I have seen, I believe, uh, Mike Wang went out to $8 Mountain in Oregon, and uh, he did a little water temperature measuring, if I'm remembering this right. And his temperatures on the day he measured were abnormal, and that they're about 65 to 70 degrees. Um, so it's unclear, I think, the extent to which Darlingtonia can tolerate um, high heat water temperatures or, you know, warmer heat water temperatures. I wouldn't really call them 65, 70 degrees high heat, but, you know, warm water temperatures. Uh, and the reason for that we'll get to a little bit later. Um, there is a, a fungus that affects the plant. And then in addition to Darlingtonia requiring cool soil and cool water, uh, it almost always has cool nights. Uh, throughout the plants range, you know, whether you are almost at sea level on the Oregon coast, or if you are up towards 7,000 feet in the Sierra Nevadas or, you know, the coastal ranges of Northern California. Daytime air temperatures can be pretty high, uh, especially in the mountain areas. You can have temperatures up to 100, 110 degrees, but at night, it almost always drops down back towards, you know, 60 over 50 degrees and cools off. And then the soil conditions for these plants, I've noticed that usually they are lightly acidic, although I've measured pH in some areas that were a little bit basic, um, not very high on the scale, you know, somewhere between seven and eight, not above eight on a pH scale. So seemingly the plants are, you know, relatively unaffected by soil pH. I haven't found an area of exceedingly hard pH. I don't know of any areas in California or Oregon um, that really have a really high alkaline level. Uh, if anyone in the chat does, I'd be curious to hear again. Um, I'd love to go and see it. And Darlingtonia, their uh, their growth habits in winter, you know, vary 
um, between coastal and mountain areas. Coastal areas are a lot milder. Uh, I live out in Humboldt County. Uh, I live just outside of Eureka a little bit. And Darlingtonia grow pretty well out here because, you know, we rarely see above 70 to 80 degrees in the summer and nighttime temperatures are always in that low, you know, 60 to 50 range. So they grow pretty well out here. Um, but in the mountainous areas, like I said, we can see, you know, upwards of 100, you know, 110 degrees, maybe on a really hot day and then still cool at night. Um, but winter conditions are pretty radically different between the two. And I will show here. Uh, I should have gone over this earlier. This is a, a serpentine seat um, that I was talking about in the Smith River area. And you can see lots of heavy gravel through here. Uh, but this is a photo of Highway 36 uh, around Lake Almanor. And you can see there's probably, I don't know, two to three feet of snow on the side. And this is it, you know, not a very relatively high elevation area, maybe 3,000 feet, I think, is where this photo was taken. Um, so these plants, you know, in mountainous areas, uh, they are pretty cold hardy. Um, you can see temperatures. I used to live in Quincy um, at three and a half thousand feet. And the coldest I ever saw there was about negative five degrees. Um, up at 7,000 feet, I'm sure that temperatures are probably much, much colder during the winter. Um, there's probably much more snowfall than three feet. Uh, but based on a little bit of um, field surveying Barry Rice had done, it would seem like even in the dead of these winter conditions, uh, water doesn't actually freeze in the fin. And, you know, there's still continuous running water over the growth points and the roots of the plants. Um, so their ability to actually survive a hard freeze, uh, I think is, you know, unknown to me. Uh, when I lived in Quincy, I actually didn't grow any Darlingtonia myself. I had Saracenia there. And out in their containers in the winter, they would freeze solid and they would return in the spring unfazed. Um, but I'm unsure if Darlingtonia shares that same ability. Uh, I'm not really in a good position to test it anymore. And then out, you know, in the fens, um, in mountainous and coastal areas, you can find them growing along some other kind of companion carnivorous plants. Uh, you can find them with Drosera rotundifolia throughout most of the plants range. You can find them with Drosera oncica, the English sundew um, throughout select portions of the plants range more around Mount Lassen. I've actually never found Drosera anglica before, um, but I, I have heard about, you know, it's located in northeastern Lassen County, I believe. And then you can find it with Pinguicula vulgaris and uh, the Smith River drainage area and up into Oregon. And then uh, at least a couple Atricularia species I'm unsure which ones they are. Um, Barry Rice has a couple of good articles on it. And those are the ones I was talking about. Uh, you could find in the lower pond at Butterfly Valley if you visit there. And then I wanted to talk about some of the interspecies relations of the plant. Uh, for a long time, um, the pollinator of Darlington in California was unknown. There were a few theories about what might pollinate the plant. Um, it could be, you know, it was thought it could have been beetles or spiders or ants or moths. Um, however, I believe the currently accepted uh, pollinator is this bee right here. This is a native mining bee. It's a solitary bee. This is Andrina uh, nigerta. And I believe uh, there was a woman out at HSU who did some research. Um, and I believe she collaborated with Barry Rice. And Barry Rice is a professor at a community college in Sierra County. Um, I believe it's Sierra College. Uh, and he went out and did some research and he, he captured this small bee and uh, on a few trips. And I believe his results were pretty conclusive that this was the pollinator. Um, before this, it wasn't really understood how, you know, Darlingtonia was pollinated. European honeybees and uh, bumblebees are too big to fit in the flowers. Uh, the flowers of Darlingtonia kind of resemble a fritillary flower. And there are some theories that Darlingtonia evolved alongside fritillaries um, and learned to mimic their flower shape and design in order to attract the same pollinator. I don't know if this native mining bee also, you know, visits uh, fritillaries or if that, you know, was kind of just an example of coincidence between the two. There are also communal midges that their larvae live within the Darlingtonia pitchers. Uh, the larvae look like 
long white worms. They're not very pretty. I don't have a good photo of them. They don't really take good photos. They're kind of yucky in my opinion, um, but they are very important. The midges lay their, their eggs in Darlingtonia pitchers in spring, and then they hatch. And Darlingtonia, in contrast with Saracenia and a lot of other carnivorous plants, doesn't produce its own digestive enzymes. So when an insect falls into a Darlingtonia pitcher and drowns, uh, it's not digested by the plant itself, but by a proxy. So the midges in there, they eat whatever prey falls into a Darlingtonia pitcher, and they do the hard work of digesting all of that prey. And then the midge excrement, which is full of, you know, still full of nutrients for the plant and much more readily available form, uh, is then absorbed by the Darlingtonia pitchers. And depending on who you talk to, some people will say that this means, you know, the Darlingtonia isn't technically carnivorous, that it is only quasi carnivorous or pseudo carnivorous or proto carnivorous. I think that that's kind of a goofy um, distinction to make personally. Darlingtonia goes to great lengths to attract and entrap and absorb nutrients um, from insects and other bugs. Um, so I think that it should qualify. You can also see this with Roverdula uh, gorgonus. Um, it is a sundew-like plant that is actually more closely related to Saracenia and Darlingtonia than sundews. And it has uh, assassin bugs that live communally with the plant. And it will entrap different insects on its leaves. You know, it's got sticky mucilage on there that won't entrap them, but it doesn't secrete any digestive enzymes. The assassin bugs come, they eat those insects, and then they poop right on the leaf, and that poop is absorbed by the plant. Um, and so I think of it, you know, just as kind of a way that the plant has reduced the workload on itself. Uh, it no longer has to produce digestive enzymes. Something else is doing that work for it, and it can just absorb the nutrients after with less work for itself. And now I will get to kind of the, um, the conservation portion of it. Uh, this is a photo during the drought, I believe in 2015 or 2016. Um, this is, I mean, it's kind of hard to see, but these are all dead Darlingtonia pitchers. This is a big mass of a, what once was a, a Darlingtonia colony. It's all dried out, desiccated and dead. So, you know, the California drought was pretty hard throughout the portions of the plants range, you know, especially the Sierra Nevadas was where I saw the worst of the drought damage. Along the coastal ranges and up into Oregon, there really wasn't as much damage that I've seen or that I, I would have been informed about. Um, I kept in touch with a lot of the forest botanists and they've kind of filled me in, you know, in areas I've been able to visit personally. Um, but this is, you know, a credible threat to Darlingtonia. Uh, you know, if the threat were to if the drought were to, you know, come back in full force or worsen, um, the plants really rely on having wet areas to grow and they're not very good at colonizing new areas. Um, so once areas like these are lost, it's, it's very difficult for the plants to come back. Um, so it's, it's kind of worrisome. And so you can see that, you know, other plants, are still growing around here. You've still got, you know, kind of the native sedges, but the Darlingtonia has died out. It's it's one of the first, you know, plants you can visibly see die out in wet areas. Um, it's it's big and showing. It's kind of a, a useful, you know, indicator I think of overall fin health because it's just so prominent in the fins where it grows. And this drought stress, it can, you know impact the plant and these plant communities abilities to respond to other stressors um, like fire. Uh, this is a photo, whoops, this is a photo I took out around Antelope Lake uh, in Plumas County where there was the moonlight fire there, I believe in the early 2000s or the late 90s. Um, and that fire burned through there so hot that it killed a lot of the seed bank of the trees. And a lot of what's come back uh, to my knowledge is a smaller shrubs and forbs and a lot of invasive plants. There's a lot of um, goat head grass out there and uh, rattlesnake grass and other you know invasive plants that are pretty hard to get rid of. Um, but the effects of fire upon Darlingtonia, as long as the fins are wet, seems to be you know pretty benign. Uh, Lynn Mazur, who also went out here to Humboldt State University, did some research on a population of plants in the Klamath National Forest 
and they had a pretty large intense fire out there several years ago. And the kind of conventional wisdom was thinking, you know, that in areas of really intense burning, probably these wetland plants, you know, they wouldn't be able to survive very well. They're not adapted to, uh, you know, really, really intense fire. Um, you know, regular controlled burns and small brush fires, you know, are, are a different thing. They're good for um, keeping fins clear and from being encroached on by shrubs, but really, really intense fire. It was thought that they wouldn't be able to survive. But Lynn went out there and surveyed the area afterwards and found that the plant leaves were all, you know, burned and desiccated. Uh, but the actual growth points of the plants, because they were so close to running water throughout the fin, were pretty um, unharmed. And that, you know, within the next growing season, the plants were able to come back and they were okay. Um, so it seems that the effects of fire upon the plants are not as severe, uh, as long as the, the fins have good running water through them. If you had a drought stricken area, the effects of fire would probably be more severe. Um, fins tend to dry out from the outside, and so there's less and less water flowing through the fin. They kind of shrink down in size until, you know, you've got almost a riparian community just along the sides of where, you know, the little water is flowing. So in a smaller community of plants like that, their ability to survive, you know, is probably lessened. Um, it may be none at all. Hopefully we don't, you know, have to find that out, although it is my suspicion that in the coming years, um, we probably will see uh, sites that are lost to drought and or to fire again. Darlingtonia is also, you know, it's subject to loss of habitat from development or neglect, um, you know, the effects of grazing or cannabis growing upon the plant. Uh, with development, there are a few sites along the Oregon coast that are fairly close to uh, you know, lake houses or smaller communities. These places where Darlingtonia grow are pretty wet and, you know, usually they're on hillsides or, you know, cliff sides and they're not very good to develop. Um, but there are some sites that are kind of around uh, smaller lakes or ponds that have been drained and paved over to make, you know, summer housing or, you know, smaller developments. It's not considered a very big threat uh, most of the plants in these areas uh, remaining are federally owned or state owned. So most of the areas that could have been developed, it seems like were developed and there weren't very many areas that could be. There's also the threat of uh, mining. Um, Bear Rice talked about it a little bit on his website. Darlingtonia occurs in pretty mineral rich areas, um, serpentine, and other, you know, ultramafic rock areas, they are rich in nickel, I believe. So if the nickel market were to suddenly shift, I guess, and nickel was worth as much as gold, you could see, you know, possible threat to these plants. Um, or, you know, if California suddenly did a 180 and said, hey, you know, we're gonna bring hydrologic mining back, um, you know, conceivably, that would be a, a big bummer. Um, but I don't think that's very likely. Uh, most of these areas are still federally or state owned. I don't see the federal government or state governments probably giving out mining claims in wetlands. They, they tend to take that stuff pretty seriously. The U.S. Forest Service, especially throughout the Sierras on the Tahoe, on the Plumas National Forest, um, try to take really good care of their Darlingtonia sites. On the Tahoe National Forest, there is only 13 sites and um, the botanist there, I believe, is Courtney Rowe. She does a pretty good job and she's She's pretty on top of taking care of their Darlingtonia sites because they've got so few and they are under, you know, pressure from other sources too. Um, and then there is neglect kind of, you know, in the results of fire suppression now. Uh, smaller shrubs can crowd out Darlingtonia and kind of grow over these wetland areas, these fins or these seeps. If anyone here is familiar with Rebecca Merritt Austin, she did some research on Darlingtonia uh, around the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, I believe. She lived in Ketty, which is a, a small town, maybe 10 or 15 minutes outside of Quincy. Um, but she did a lot of research with Darlingtonia, you know, kind of established that the plant was carnivorous and its growth habits. Um, she fed the plants, I believe, egg whites and beef broth. 
um, some of her experience where she would add, you know, a little bit of uh, beef broth into the pitchers and measure the fluid level in the pitchers, you know, after she added, and then she would come back, you know, an hour, a few hours later and measure again. And the fluid level had come up. So, you know, when the plants are trapping prey or, you know, other nutrient dense matter like beef broth, they submit more or they secrete more um, water to aid in the digestion of whatever they've trapped. But back to my, uh, my subject of kind of, you know, overgrowth here. Uh, the Darlingtonia site that Rebecca Merritt Austin went out to was just, I believe, south of Ketty um, and kind of up a hill around there. And it has actually been um, not destroyed by, you know, human action, but kind of human inaction. Uh, that area is so thick and densely overcrowded that where the Darlingtonia used to grow along the stream there, there is none left. Um, there's no more peat really, or any sphagnum um, throughout the area. I think that there is mainly ramnus shrubs. I forget the species, um, but it's just a dense thicket of ramnus shrubs and not much else. So that area has been overcrowded and it's, you know, transitioned from being a wetland area uh, with Darlingtonia in it to kind of just a, um, a riparian shrubby area. And that seems to be a natural progression, I think, but you know, the progression has been hastened by, you know, human suppression of fire. Uh, and in the same way, there are, uh, there is grazing that occurs primarily out in the Sierras, uh, cattle grazing um, that does something similar. So before the creation of the U.S. Forest Service, there were cattle ranchers that they were allowed to graze their cattle out in the Sierra Nevadas. And once the Forest Service was created, these cattle ranchers still wanted to graze their cattle out there. They said, you know, we were here first and the federal government granted them easements to, you know, graze their cattle out there in perpetuity. Um, so it's been about a hundred years, I believe, since the formation of the Forest Service, they're still out there grazing their cattle. And these cattle come through and they pockmark their areas. And you can see that on this slide here. Um, these are cattle tracks, you know, they come through and they pockmark and they make kind of slides and, you know, tear up the surface of the fen. Um, and it can actually be, you know, dangerous for the cattle out on the Bucks Lake Wilderness. There are quaking fens out there, which is basically a pond with a, a thick mat of sphagnum that's grown over it. And they're pretty cool. I've been out on a couple. You can go out there and it, the ground kind of undulates and, you know, makes waves when you walk. It's cool, but you can't stand next to another person. You might fall through. And the cattle are a lot heavier than people. So when they go out on the quaking fins, A, they tear through the surface and they tear up the sphagnum. And that's kind of a bummer. But B, they fall right through into the pond beneath the sphagnum and then they drown. And the cattle ranchers usually aren't real happy, you know, that they've lost a cow. Um, but the cattle come through, you know, in areas that aren't quaking fins and they pockmark the surface like this. And these pockmarks, you know, the water tends to run through the pockmarks because they're lower depression areas. And then the water will run from pockmark to pockmark to pockmark, and it will erode as it goes, these pockmarks into little gullies, and then these gullies into just little streams. And then in extreme cases, these little streams into, you know, fast moving water that's at the bottom of like a six foot trench. And I've seen that out on the uh, Bucks Lake Wilderness area, um, where in fins that have been heavily grazed and run on by these cattle. Uh, the outsides of the fin have dried out because the water is no longer percolating through the whole thing. It is now concentrated in a very quick moving stream at the bottom of like a six foot trench in the middle of the fin. And the Forest Service has gone out there. This was when I was out there. It was like 2016 or 2017. I don't know how it's going now, um, but they were trying to dam it up and slow down water movement because, you know, it was just eroding more and more of the fin, you know, going down towards bedrock. Um, so, you know, it's a pretty serious problem when that starts to happen you know the, the outside of the fin dries out you know the plants that live there that are on the outside dry out and you have what was once a fin you know transition into just a repairing area and community um, if possible you know it's kind of hard to transition to a repairing community if it's at the bottom of a six foot trench but you know for what it's worth it could and I think that that may be you know kind of a natural progression too that's exacerbated by the cattle because on the Klamath National Forest 
there are elk out there. And I didn't realize uh, the first you know, couple of years I was out there that there is a sizable elk population. And on a lot of those sites, I saw what I thought was cattle damage. You know, the plants out there were grazed and cattle do graze on Darlingtonia. A lot of these heavily grazed areas, um, the plants don't reproduce sexually. Um, their flowers, when they send them up in spring, are eaten and their first pitchers are eaten. And so the plants in those areas are pretty diminutive. You know, they're not usually over like six inches in height because the cattle are pretty hard on them. Um, but the elk will come through and kind of do similar. You know, they'll graze on the plants a little bit and they'll also pockmark the fence. Um, so this may be kind of a natural progression from, you know, a wider fin back down into a stream, um, but it certainly seems more severe to me with the cattle than it probably would be with a smaller herd of elk. Um, because, you know, they're, when I've seen it at least, you know, those cattle herds out there, there's a lot of cattle at once, much more than I've ever seen in an elk herd or a deer herd or anything like that. And the ranchers are not really interested in my experience at least they're not super interested in trying to get their cows to stay away from these areas or you know trying to run them in different areas um i don't know if there's much that can be done you know as far as the plants go uh you could and i was thinking about trying to get with the before botanist courtney row in these areas to maybe put up tomato cages around some of these plants um, or something similar just to try to keep the cattle off of some of them so you know maybe some can set seed and the Forest Service can collect a little seed to keep as a seed bank in case these areas are destroyed. Um, but the rest of you know the habitat, there's not really much you can do besides removing the whole cattle, you know, from the area. Um, and when I was there with the Forest Service, I think my suggestion was to reintroduce wolves, and um, that wasn't received very well, mostly by the ranchers. They weren't very happy with that suggestion, but I thought it was a good idea. Um, I like the wolves. I think they should come back. And then in uh, mainly the coastal ranges of California, um, there is the effects of cannabis growing and um, sometimes poaching that goes on out here too. Uh, so with cannabis growing, from what I've seen, usually weed growers are not planting their plants, you know, right where Darling Tony grow in the same habitat because the soils there are pretty poor. You know, a lot of times they're serpentinic soils, you know, that's toxic to a lot of plants. And um, the water there is usually too much for, you know, the cannabis plants. You know, they need water, but they don't need to be inundated. I think they get root rot and, you know, they get pretty unhappy. But they will divert water from different areas. And, you know, if they divert water away from a fin, you know, the fin could dry out in part or completely. Um, the herbicides and pesticides and fertilizers they use can impact the plants um you know mainly these plants or you know weed growers are growing in areas you know like southern trinity county or mendocino county or humboldt county where there are not as many darlingtonia plants you know, usually darlingtonia are in northern trinity county you know there's none in humboldt so they don't overlap a whole lot but where they do you know there is some uh, effect on the darlingtonia it hasn't been major from what i've seen um, but I haven't been, you know, I haven't been around long enough to kind of compare before and after, you know, before cannabis growing became a big California industry, you know, both legally and illegally and after, you know, it became a big industry. So I'm, I'm not sure, you know, maybe at one point in time, there were a lot more darling Tony that grew in Southern Trinity County that were extirpated, you know, by cannabis growers. Um, I think it's unlikely, but it's a possibility. Uh, and then poaching. Um, most carnivorous plant growers know that Darlingtonia are pretty hard to grow because of their um, soil temperature requirements. But there have been some nurseries here and there that have poached. There was one out in Crescent City, I believe, that was going out semi-regularly to a site on Six Rivers National Forest area. And um, the Six Rivers National Forest and the forest botanist there, I believe his name is John McRae, uh, set up a sting or you know whatever is analogous for a sting for the Forest Service and caught them. And I think fined them heavily, something on the order of like 500 to $1,000 per plant they caught them taking. Um, and they don't do that anymore. I don't even know if that nursery you know, survived those fines to keep doing business. Um, so it's not a huge threat like I said, most people know that Darlingtonia are hard to grow. And poached Darlingtonia, you know, when you rip those plants out of the ground, 
it sends them into shock. You wind up breaking their roots. You know, they're just unhappy and their likelihood of survival is pretty slim. Most people know that. Uh, there was another site on the Seaslaw National Forest, I believe, kind of by Darling Tony at Wayside in Florence, Oregon, um, where the forest botanist there uh, told me that they had a Darling Tony site that he was monitoring. And then one day he showed up and there were, you know, a few shovels on the ground and no more plants. Um, so, you know, it does happen. And to compare that with Saracenia, you know, in the American Gulf Coast and East Coast up in Canada, um, poaching, poaching is a pretty credible concern. Um, there are some species that are pretty rare um, and on the brink of extinction in the wild, like Saracenia oreopila, Saracenia unessi, Saracenia albumensis, um, Saracenia wary, that the sites are pretty, you know, the remaining ones are well guarded. Um, but back in the day, I think in the 70s or the 80s, when Saracenia oreopila was first described, it was considered, you know, pretty locally abundant. And there was no, you know, great fear, uh, to my understanding, at least, there was no great fear about Saracenia oreopila being, you know, going extinct in the wild. And now, you know, four or five decades later, uh, the effects of development, you know, a lot of Saracenia sites are pretty level, so they wind up getting drained and then paved over to make, you know, commercial areas or residential areas. Um, but the effects of development and poaching, uh, a lot of Saracenia plants have been poached, um, whole sites have been poached out of existence um, somewhat frequently. But Saracenia oryphila is now on track to be the first Saracenia species that goes extinct in the wild. Um, and, you know, it's expected to happen well within our lifetimes, you know, probably within the next decade or two, you know, at the most. Um, so, you know, it's certainly possible, you know, if the market for Darlingtonia plants were to shift, you know, if uh, all of a sudden Darlingtonia became like aeroids and the prices for them started to skyrocket, you could probably conceivably see it happen. Um, I hope it doesn't. It would be a big bummer, um, but it could. Um, you know, some of these areas are fairly close to you know, well-populated areas. Um, a lot of the plants along with Smith River drainage, fairly close to Crescent City. There are plants, you know, throughout Plumas and Sierra and Nevada County that are close to, you know, besides Quincy and Chester and Placerville and other smaller mountain towns, you know, you've got Chico and Oroville and other towns. And then, you know, up throughout the Oregon coast, there's a lot of towns that, you know, are dotted along Highway 101 up there. Um, so hopefully it doesn't happen, but, you know, it's set up so that if it did, it could basically. And uh, I did want to talk about too, um, Saracenia a little bit. You know, I'm I am on the the board of uh, the North American Saracenia Conservancy um, or NASC, just as an acronym. And Saracenia only has about one to three percent, I believe, of its natural habitat remaining. Um, most of that habitat has been, you know either developed for commercial or residential. Um, it has been, you know, these plants have been poached. Um, these areas have been, you know, drained or they have been, you know, in the, the effects of fire suppression, they've been overcrowded and lost. Um, and a lot of those areas uh, before the arrival of European settlers, um, to my knowledge, a lot of those areas were pretty frequently burned and kept open, um, you know, to preserve them, you know, for hunting or other uses, um, you know, just to keep them open areas. Uh, and now in the absence of that fire, you know, shrubs, kind of the same thing I talked about with Rebecca Merritt Austin site shrubs, and other taller plants have come in and overshadowed the smaller plants like Saracenia and Drosera and Pinguicula, um, and they've just kind of died out. And they can persist for quite a while, um, you know, maybe years, maybe a decade, um, but when these plants are subject to really low, low light conditions, when Saracenia is low, low light conditions, um, they stop flowering, they stop reproducing sexually, and they just kind of dwindle. Um, Saracenia is a clumping plant. Um, you know, they kind of just form, you know, offshoots of their rhizomes and get just kind of a very clumpy behavior. Uh, but in the absence of a lot of light and a lot of nutrient, they, they grow pretty slowly and they dwindle and they die out. Uh, Darlingtonia, on the other hand, even in areas where it's pretty heavily shaded, it can persist for a long time. Out in Butterfly Valley, there was a section of it before they removed the road through there. Uh, that was 
shaded out by a lot of Douglas pines or Douglas firs and uh, some other shrubs. And the plants aren't as attractive. They're pretty green and atoliated, but they still flower. They still set seed uh, pretty vigorously and they still grow pretty well. So Darlingtonia seems to be, you know, much more resistant uh, to the effects of kind of um, overgrowth than Saracenia are. And Darlingtonia also spreads through rhizomes um, or stolons off of their rhizomes. And if you're unfamiliar with what a stolon is, it's kind of like, um, think about it almost like how crabgrass or uh, spider grass spreads, you know, they form kind of long horizontal stems um, with a baby plant on the tip. And Darlingtonia does that pretty prolifically um, to the point where, you know, when you're in a Darlingtonia fin, a lot of the plants you're looking at are probably clones of uh, just one plant that's spread by stolons throughout the whole thing. And then I wanted to talk too about the uh, past damages um, to Darlingtonia's range. Uh, this slide right here is um, what I conjecture to be, you know, maybe a, a broad idea of what Darlingtonia's historic range may have looked like. Um, and, you know, long before, um, you know, European settlers were keeping track of Darlingtonia populations. Uh, there was the gold rush um, of 1849, you know, kind of the, the mass settlement of California, the creation of dams and uh, other hydroelectric projects um, that have, you know, impacted the plant's range. Um, and a big one is probably hydraulic mining throughout the Sierras, um, you know, where they would wash away, you know, whole mountains or halves of mountains, you know, any Darlingtonia that were on that mountain would certainly be gone. Um, there was large scale plant poaching. I don't have access to the photo, but at Plumas National Forest, uh, Mount Huff Ranger District, Jim Belcher Howe, there's the forest botanist, or he used to be, he's getting close to retirement, he may have retired. Um, but he has a photo of a, a flea market in Sacramento, right around, you know, the early 1900s or very late 1800s, like the 1890s. And it is a stall with like hundreds to thousands of potted up Darlingtonia plants. And I I don't imagine anyone, you know, during that time was probably running, you know, a large scale Darlingtonia nursery. Um, the plants are pretty hard to propagate by seed. Um, you could do them from divisions pretty easily, but that's a lot of investment and you would have to be providing them growing conditions that would be pretty hard to replicate in Sacramento. Um, so I think it's much more likely that these plants were being poached from, you know, easy to grab areas in the Sierra foothills or, you know, it's hard to say. There are, you know, a lot of potential habitat for the plant, a lot of wetlands kind of throughout the Sierra foothills. There's a couple in Butte County um, that look like they would be good. And Barry Rice has gone out there. There's a couple of small colonies of plants that he's unsure, you know, if they're native or if somebody went out there and just sprinkled some seeds at one point in time and forgot about them. You know, it's kind of an experiment that they never wrote down. Um, but there certainly are uh, habitats that these plants could conceivably grow and that they're absent from. Um, and they may have been, you know, about 100, 120, 130 years ago, just collected from in mass and just extirpated from these areas. Um, so it's hard to say, you know, I, I don't know of any records from that time about, you know, darling Tony collection or poaching. Um, so it's hard to say, you know, how much of their range was affected that way. And so this is, you know, what I, I kind of conjecture to be, you know, maybe Darlingtonia's historic range from, you know, just north of Lake Tahoe up to, you know, the western Oregon coast, you know, probably excluding most of the California Central Valley and kind of the uh, Great Basin area through here. But this is just a rough idea. And then today, this is what their modern range more or less looks like. And I've kind of lumped them together based on, you know, which sites are close enough to interbreed with each other. Um, which I believe, you know, most bees can fly about five to 10 miles uh, to different plants to, you know, pollinate one another and have, you know, gene flow between different populations. Um, so there's a couple populations in the Sierras, you know, there are some um, kind of around, I think this is Highway 80 right here. There's some more around Chester and Lake Almanor, and then some around Trinity Lake, and then Smith River drainage area, and then up through the Oregon coast. So modern day, the plants range is really fragmented. Um, you can see that these areas, you know, there's a handful of them that are not within, you know, these, these areas are certainly not within 
uh, a bee's flight from each other. Um, so they are isolated. They are not sexually reproducing with each other. There is no gene flow between them. Um, and so, you know, depending upon how long this has been going on, uh, inbreeding could be a risk, you know, for these plants. Uh, it's demonstrated in cultivation that inbred Saracenia and inbred Darlingtonia do worse than, um, you know, plants that are not inbred. You know, plants that are, or, you know, seeds that are inbred have lower germination rates, they have lower survival rates, and typically slower growth rates. Um, so they seem just less adapted to survive if they are inbred. And uh, there's also, you know, to consider the effects of past climate change, uh, glaciation, you know, a lot of these areas could represent, you know, kind of glacial refugia, um, you know, that just heavily areas that were not heavily glaciated, um, you know, would have been areas these plants survived. So, you know, in addition to past damages from mining and, you know, plant poaching, um, you know, just past climate change could have fragmented the plant's range into what we see uh, today. You know, the effects of current climate change could, you know, exacerbate it even further, you know, especially drought and uh, fire. Um, but, you know, these, these sites of poor gene flow, you know, inbreeding possibly. Um, and so I've done a little research with uh, Darlingtonia to look at Darlingtonia seedlings. Um, these are Darlingtonia seedlings. You can see here they have two cotyledons. And then their first true leaf is a grass-like leaf, which is this. Um, I'm sorry, they're very hard to photograph. These are like the size of, you know, pinheads. I was trying to take a photo with a, a loop and my phone. So, but they've got a little grass-like leaf and then their first, um, you know, kind of pitcher form leaf. Um, and so I've been doing work with the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management for however long it's been since like 2016 or 2017. Uh, I've got the right permits to go out. They let me collect a little bit of seed on the order of like 100 to 200 seeds per um, area. Uh, and Darlingtonia are pretty prolific seeders. Uh, they can form like up to a thousand seeds per seed pod, I believe. They're, they're just, you know, massive seed pods with lots and lots of seeds in them. And each growth point will put out a flower. So if you've got a big population of plants, you can just be swimming in seed. You know, it's very easy. 100 to 200 seed um, on a healthy population is really not a lot of reproductive strain on them. Um, but, you know, to go out and collect a little bit of seed and then to germinate some, you know, in germination tests, see, you know, what germination rates are like. Um, and then to look at the seedlings and see, you know, do they have mutations? Um, do they grow slow, you know, slower than normal? Darlingtonia, a pretty slow growing uh, plant. Um, this photo right here is some seeds I stratified and germinated. I think I stratified them in November or December of 2017. They germinated in February, March of 2018. And I have these same plants growing out in my backyard right now still, um, you know, just monitoring them, researching them a little bit still. But they are not much bigger than about a quarter. And so Darlingtonia in their native range, you know, Humboldt County is not where any Darlingtonia grow, but the climatic conditions here are, you know, similar enough that I would call it, you know, analogous to growing within its native range, you know, and in the more milder coastal portions of it. Um, that they are just such slow growing plants. Those plants now are four years old and they're still seedlings. I would still call them seedlings. So throughout the plant's native range, it is really hard for a Darlingtonia plant to, you know, germinate and establish itself as an individual. So most Darlingtonia propagation is probably done asexually. And uh, we've seen a little bit of this in practice in areas that were damaged by drought. Um, where the outsides of the fins or even, you know, most of the fin has uh, died and dried out. Uh, the Darlingtonia are pretty quick to recolonize the outer portions of the fin with their stolons. Um, and, you know, to pop up more, more individuals that are clones, um, but, you know, just to establish their kind of supremacy in those areas. Um, you know, to, to establish from seed is pretty hard for Darlingtonia. And, you know, to colonize new areas is pretty hard. Um, and, you know, the method by which Darlingtonia can colonize new areas is, um, you know, by seed at least is kind of not well understood. 
Uh, it used to be thought that Darlingtonia were spread by uh, either, you know, kind of latching on to animal fur because their seeds have lots of little, they almost look like barbed hooks on them. Um, but in my experience, you know, I've kind of crudely tested on myself, tested in my own hair, you know, on my woolly socks or on my, my jeans or other, you know, articles of clothing. I have not gotten Darlingtonia seeds to adhere very well to me. But what I have noticed is that the seeds, when you drop them in water, uh, they float pretty readily. And those little hooks on the surface of the seed, um, I believe, you know, just kind of serve to trap air so that the seeds float on the surface of the water and they can spread to other areas. Um, now their, you know, their possibility of surviving to adulthood and reproducing is really, really slim. Um, but that would seem to be uh, I think at least, you know, the manner by which Darlingtonia spreads by seed. Um, spreading by stolen, you know, is good for recolonizing, you know, portions of the same fin or, you know, wetlands that are upstream or downstream if a piece of plant breaks off and floats down. But spreading, you know, any, any further than upstream or downstream would really need to be accomplished by seed. Um, and so I'm unsure if, uh, you know, the present, you know, extreme slow growth of Darlingtonia seedlings is the results of, you know, decades or, you know, centuries of Darlingtonia inbreeding, um, or if that is how they've always been. And it's always been just, you know, a tremendous struggle for them to colonize new areas and to germinate, or if maybe, you know, climatic conditions have shifted to where, you know, seedling germination now is kind of not favored and it's much more difficult for the plants than it was in the past. Um, so it's hard to say really. Uh, but you know, the rest of the rest of the seeds from that, you know, my little bit of research, um, I save with the, the North American Saracini Conservancy and with the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management so that if, you know, or when these Starling Tony sites are destroyed, um, that the, the, uh, genetic, you know, variants of that site, the genetic uniqueness of that site, you know, isn't totally lost. We still have seeds from that site. You know, we can still germinate, you know, seeds that came from that site and are representative of that site, um, either for later reintroduction or, you know, maybe future breeding programs. If the species were ever to be in that, you know, situation to where we needed to try to breed Darlingtonia. Um, I think it's worth noting Darlingtonia is a pretty popular uh, plant among carnivorous plant growers. Um, you can find them at lots of specialized nurseries, you know, like California carnivores or other ones. Um, and even, you know, occasionally grocery stores will have them. They do pretty well in tissue culture, to my understanding. I've never been successful in my tissue culture attempts, but, you know, big companies will do large batches of Darlingtonian tissue culture and sell them, you know, kind of like you see Venus flytraps in grocery stores. I've seen them, you know, a handful of times. It does happen. But those plants, are you know all clones of each other, um, so it's hard to say you know if if Darlingtonia were to become extinct in the wild, if it would be viable to try to reintroduce them someday, you know, with plants just taken from horticultural stock, or you know if we would need you know a seed bank or you know a lot of individuals from the plant's native range uh, to kind of you know re reseed the species. Um, I think it's worth it definitely just to keep at least a small seed bank. And, you know, individuals from each major population center kind of, you know, around so that you can continue to breed the plant. And you can continue to foster that genetic diversity in the species. Um, so, you know, from what we what we can see then is basically, you know, darling Tony doesn't have an impact range or an intact range. Um, the range is already heavily damaged, you know, probably as a result of, um, you know, human European settler activity and uh you know past climatic damage and you know current climatic damage and you know in the future it's probably going to get more severe um, and impact the plant you know much greatly much more greatly um, so going forward the future of the species is kind of uncertain um, it's just my hope that with the seed bank and uh, you know germinating individuals and studying them uh, that hopefully you know it's survival can be guaranteed or as close to guaranteed as we can get um, and, you know, if anyone is interested in, you know, trying to uh, assist in some way, you can go and talk to, you know, your local Forest Service or BLM office. Um, you know, a lot of them 
would be super happy to have a, a botanical or forestry volunteer. Um, in 2016, I volunteered at the Forest Service all summer. I was in high school, I had a great time. Um, kind of difficult, you know, if you need a job and an income, but if you don't, you know, it'd be a great opportunity. and You could have fun and learn quite a bit. Um, or you could reach out to uh, me or someone else at the North American Saracenia Conservancy um, to see about the grower program. You know, we do send plants out uh, to people to grow um, because we don't have like a central greenhouse. And the, the deal is, um, as I understand it, is, you know, you get to keep the plants and then the first two years of seed uh, that, you know, if you pollinate the plants, the first two years of seed, we ask for you to give back to our seed bank. You know, we ask that you just breed the plants with, you know, either you self them, you know, if you only have one plant or, you know, which is unlikely, or you breed them only with plants, um, that we've given you from that same area. And then you send that seed back to us and you get to keep those individuals because the individual plants are a lot less valuable, you know, conservation wise than the seed and the seed bank would be. Um, and at that point, I think I will end my presentation. And uh, if anyone has any questions, or actually, um, Shane will be managing the chat, so I, I believe he'll ask me the questions now. Wow, what a what a fantastic uh, and a huge amount of information you just shared with us. I'm very appreciative. Um, if, if people want to get in touch with you and find out more about your work or about the um, about the Saracenia Conservancy, how do you suggest they reach out and, and uh, get in touch with you? Um, I will give you my email um, or, you know, I can just, I can type it in the chat uh, for anyone to email me. Um, North American Saracenia does have a website. I can put that in the chat as well for people, you know, if you want to go there and just reach out in general. Um, we did just have our elections, but if anyone is, you know, interested in joining or something like that, um, you definitely can. Uh, most of the North American Saraceni Conservancy is located on the East Coast. I've been trying to find people who are interested in starting, you know, like a West Coast board so that we can more efficiently manage things out here or, you know, monitor things out here so that, you know, we've got kind of a, a Darlingtonia centric um, West Coast side of it. And then if you're interested in, you know, any of the other uh, research I talked about, like Lynn Missouri's fire research or, you know, some of the stuff Barry Rice had done, or, you know, past pollination research, um, I can email that to anyone who wants it as well. Fantastic. Yeah, why don't we put that in the chat? Um, and why don't, why don't we do it now? So in case people's questions start flowing in, we don't uh, lose it at the very end there. Okay. Yeah, um, let me do that. In the meantime, if you're able to type and listen at the same time, I've got a question of my own to start with. Uh, I'm curious, I know our local populations of, um, of Darlingtonia and those uh, in say like Sierra County and possibly even those going up into Plumas County don't seem to be existing on any ultra mafic substrate. And as, as I understand it, that's the main uh, habitat that they occupy in say the Klamaths. Um, so number one, I'm wondering, is that is that true? And then do you notice in going between the different populations that there's any sort of discernible difference between plants that grow on ultramafic substrates uh, as opposed to not in their morphology or, or any other thing that you could notice? Um, you know, throughout the Smith River drainage is, you know, usually where you can find the plants growing on serpentine and other ultramafic uh, substrates, um, like you said. The only big difference I've noticed between the two is that the Smith River plants tend to be a little bit taller and some, well, almost all of the time, a lot more red. Um, I've never seen a lot of redness in the Sierra range. Um, I don't know if that is, you know, because they are growing on large amounts of serpentine or if it's because, you know, climatic conditions there are just a little bit different or, you know, some kind of genetic variance within the species that maybe those plants just aren't, you know, as adapted to um, UV radiation or something like that. You know, a lot of times redness can be, you know, anthocyanin can be a response to, you know, a sunburn basically on the plant. Um, but, you know, usually the Sierra plants I've seen, they tend to be uh, stockier and uh, more yellowish um, with not a lot of red coloration on them. Interesting. Is there, um, in the Smith River drainage, is there less competition from other plants as opposed to our fens out here in the Sierras? Not that from I've noticed. Rest. Yeah, not that I've noticed, to be honest. Um, a lot of the, the fens are, 
really a host to really similar or the same plants that are growing alongside Darlingtonia, you know, either as companion plants or as competition. Gotcha. Um, well, Rebecca has a question. Uh, she wants to know how long can a, a colony live under ideal conditions? And I guess uh, I'd be curious to tack on uh, a colony compared to like an individual plant. I mean, I know you said they're slow growing. I think that typically means they're relatively long lived, but uh, you know, is there any idea for how long Darlingtonia live in ideal conditions? I do not have the slightest clue. Um, I take a little bit of solace in knowing that my plants will more than likely outlive me as long as I take care of them. Um, you know, Darlingtonia are so clonal that, I mean, it would be conceivable that, you know, one genetic individual could probably live forever given the right conditions. Um, I mean, they just, they form stolons and they spread so easily. Um, you know, one individual plant may eventually succumb to like a, a fungus or something, um, you know, with, uh, with past leaf litter laying over on a growth point or something like that, um, uh, because they do kind of, you know, build up around the growth point. You can't get fungus or, you know, pests that live in there, um, that will eventually kill that individual, but, you know, spreading through stolons and, uh, splitting rhizomes and stuff, they, you know, that one plant, you know, that's split into two, you know, could live for just a long time longer longer than a human i would imagine so all right thank you yeah do we have any more questions uh yeah feel free to type them up and send them to us um one thing uh you had mentioned sort of sort of briefly and i'm not sure if i understood completely was were you implying that um at one point in the evolutionary lineage of Darlingtonia or in, in the Saracenaceae family that they once did produce digestive enzymes and, and have lost that? Or did I misunderstand? No, it is. It's possible that all Saracenaceae members produce digestive enzymes because uh, to my knowledge, all Saracenia species produce digestive enzymes and some Heliamphora species produce digestive enzymes. And Heliamphora is um, another sister genus to Darlingtonia and Saracenia that lives in South America. Um, on the Tapui tabletop mountains in Venezuela, Colombia, and northern Brazil. Um, but Darlingtonia does not. So, and Darling, the, the relationship between the three is Saracenia and Heliamphora are thought to be much more closely related to each other than either of them are to Darlingtonia. So Darlingtonia is kind of the most basal group of the clade. Um, so, you know, Darlingtonia may have, you know, kind of split off from their evolutionary, you know, family tree. Uh, before uh, the creation or, you know, the, the uh, adaptation to produce digestive enzymes, or they may have had it. And then, you know, the midges may have just made it so that it was redundant and the plants quit producing digestive enzymes. See, very interesting. Uh, Kenichi asks, um, what are your feelings about gorilla gardeners introducing Darlingtonia to parts of California outside of its current range, but within its potential historic range? Well, I have, um, I have heard about that in around Fort Bragg, I believe. Um, there was a few records for Darlingtonia site there in the late 1800s that was destroyed. Um, and I've heard that they've been reintroduced there as well as other areas. Um, as far as my feelings about it go, I'm generally not a huge fan of introducing plants into areas that they're not native to, even within states that they are native to, um, you know, and then introducing these plants back into areas that they may have grown in. I think it would depend, you know, upon the long-term, uh, goals of the, you know, cultivating those plants there and reintroducing them. Um, you know, if you have good genetic stock and, uh, you know, the plants could form uh, a healthy sexually reproducing colony um, and, you know, it was done with, you know, landowner permission, you know, whether it be private or federal or state, um, then I guess it would be all right, you know, if I was king. <laughs> I would ideally like to do it, you know, with plants or, you know, with seed um, that was taken from that area already or, you know as close of an area as possible. Sure. And that's why the, the seed banking efforts you, you mentioned are just so important. So those efforts could be made in the future. Yeah. 
yeah, but you know, I've, I've seen uh, other people that have introduced them in, you know, areas like outside of Seattle or British Columbia, or, you know, there's even supposed to be some plants growing in Norway. Um, and usually with that, I'm not such a fan, you know, you can see in uh, peat bogs in the UK, and I think in Switzerland, people had uh, introduced Saracenia purpurea, and um, they grew wonderfully, um, but they, they outcompeted the native plants. And just recently, they went and removed a lot of them. And then in Butterfly Valley, some people had introduced, um, I think, Saracenia purpurea, uh, one other Saracenia species, and uh, Drosera hybrida. Um, and they were, you know, competing with Darlingtonia. And, you know, the native Drosera rotunda foliage for resources, and the Forest Service went out there and pulled them all. Very interesting. Yeah, I guess they were successive because having gone out there last year, I didn't, I didn't see any Saracenia around. No, that's been, I think, about a decade ago now that they did that. So it's been quite a while. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much. Uh, just extend, you know, our deepest gratitude as a chapter to you for being willing to come and talk to us. I think we all learned a lot. I uh, want to let everyone know again that if you want to rewatch this presentation, we'll have it on our YouTube channel. Uh, and keep an eye out for our upcoming events. And with that, um, yeah, thank you once again. And um, feel free to reach out to Jameson if you have any questions that come to you as soon as we end this meeting here. Uh, and with that, we will say good night. And so thanks a lot, Jameson. Thanks for having me, Shane.